Welcome to Exhibition, an Xbox podcast, episode number 73. This is my second time recording this show because microphones are just a really great time. But on today's show, we are talking about Gotham Knights being locked to 30 frames per second on console, with one developer blaming the Xbox Series S. We'll talk about why that may not be the case and more in a moment, but we also have Scorn reviews to dig into, which is currently sitting at a 72 on Metacritic. We'll talk about what that means for Xbox Game Pass, and Razer has a new cloud gaming handheld on the way. So without further ado, let's go ahead and dive into it. Gotham Knights is one of the biggest games of the year, and it's launching later this week on the Xbox Series X, S, and PlayStation 5. I say that to emphasize that this is a next-generation exclusive title. So now that we've made that known, the game is going to be locked at 30 frames per second on consoles. And this started to circulate on Twitter, and then finally, the official Discord put out a statement writing, I know many of you are wondering about the availability of a performance mode for Gotham Knights on consoles. Due to the types of features we have in our game, like providing a fully untethered co-op experience and our highly detailed open world, it's not as straightforward as lowering the resolution and getting a higher FPS. For this reason, our game does not have a performance or quality toggle option and will run at 30 FPS on consoles. So, the reasoning behind this is that the cooperative open world is causing some technical limitations in the game itself. That is unfortunate, and it sounds very similar to what's happening with Halo Infinite and 343 with Network Campaign Co-op, where it did have to be pushed out so the team could figure out workarounds of how to make this open world accessible for two or more Spartans at one time. Even so, my biggest issue with Gotham Knights being locked to 30 FPS on console is with the marketing itself leading up to the release of the game. Because the majority of gameplay that we've seen has been 60 FPS. The majority of content that we've seen has been 60 FPS. And to limit the console version of the game to 30 while making your marketing material 60 feels like it's a little bit misleading. I'm not saying it's false advertising, but I am saying we should have had more transparency up front, and I think that would have solved a lot of these issues. But people would have still complained, let's not mince words about it. Because this is a next generation game, and generally speaking, no matter the technical limitations of your game, the understanding from the gaming community is that this generation is about choice. If you want 4K, then you should be able to play at 4K 60, or you could choose 4K 30 with ray tracing enabled or 4K 30 with higher quality textures, the way that Deathloop did it a couple of weeks ago. But Deathloop and Gotham Knights are very different games with very different gameplay experiences. This co-op thing seems to be throwing off the way the Gotham Knights uh, brings in the power of the console and uses it in the world you're exploring. But one developer is claiming the Xbox Series S is to blame, and I'm reading from Twisted Voxel, uh, which covers Lee Devonald. I believe I said that correctly, could be Lee Devonald, uh, over on Twitter, who has been throwing out tweets attacking the Xbox Series S, blaming it for games this generation being held back. In fact, he writes, the Series S exists, though, and Microsoft won't let you launch on one without the other. An entire generation of games hamstrung by that potato. Now, he has a whole slew of tweets, once again, uh, attacking the smaller Xbox Series S. And to his point, the Xbox Series S GPU provides roughly four teraflops of power, while the Xbox Series X GPU provides more than 10 teraflops. So there's obviously a big difference there. And I'm not somebody who gets into the technical limitations of one console or the other. And I'm also not a developer. But Twisted Voxel also points out that the minimum specs on PC that are reported on via Steam are an NVIDIA GeForce GTX 1660 Ti or AMD Radeon RX 590, DirectX version 12, 45 gigs of available space, and an Intel Core i5 9600K or AMD Ryzen 5 3600. 
Now, for the people that aren't technically savvy, those are not beefy specs. That is not a mind-boggling PC. That's what I would consider to be right at a middle-of-the-road PC, if not lower to mid-end. Uh, and so, that's targeting 1080p 60fps. Whenever you see Cyberpunk bringing a 60fps patch to Xbox Series S, and yes, it may run at a lower resolution, but that's the choice that people have to make. It's all about giving players the choice. And so, I am not a developer, but based on the minimum PC specs, I think that if additional time was put in to the game to optimize it, it should be possible. It should be something that players have the option to do. And so with all of this conversation that's happened over the past few days, I personally am going to choose to wait to see if a performance mode does come to the Xbox Series X version of the game at the very least, if not the Xbox Series S, because I do want to play on console, and it seems like it should be possible to get this running at 60 FPS. I don't know about the co-op world. I don't know how that impacts the game. And I hope that maybe Digital Foundry does a deeper dive into the performance of the game. And I've seen people on Twitter uh, that have been discussing how the game performs. Some people say they've had hands-on time with it and it runs fine. Uh, 30 frames per second doesn't impact the overall experience. And to be fair, 30 FPS is not a make it or break it when you really start playing the game. But with the new generation of consoles and a next-gen exclusive at that, it just stands to reason that players are expecting choice. And I think that's reasonable. Uh, but at the same time, for people that are upset about this, don't attack developers. Don't berate them on Twitter. It's something that they had to choose to do, and they have made that choice. And now we just have to move forward with this decision that they've made. I don't think this is going to make Gotham Knights a bad game, but when you look back at the Arkham games that have come out in the past, Arkham Knight, for example, that's the level of quality that I want for Gotham Knights. Will it hit that? Uh, time will tell, my friends. Time will tell. The reviews are out this week. The game is out October 21st. If you're diving in, let me know down below, or if this graphics option uh, or this, this limitation has changed your perception of the game and you aren't going to be checking it out, also let me know. I'm very interested to hear your thoughts. Scorn is officially out now on PC, Xbox Series X, and Xbox Series S, and if you do want to dive in and check it out, it's available via Xbox Game Pass for console and for PC as well. The reviews are in, and it's sitting currently at a 72 on Metacritic with a user score of 6.7, so definitely right in the middle of the road. Now, I will say with that 72 score, we have 53 critic reviews, 32 of which gave a positive review, 17 gave a mixed, and 4 gave a negative. Just scrolling through, Attack of the Fanboy gave it a 100, a perfect score. That's a very bold move to make. VG247 gave it an 80. Comicbook.com also gave it an 80. And then you continue going down. PC Games gave it a 70. Games Radar gave it a 70. IGN gave it a 70. Then down even further, GameSpot gave it a 40. VGC gives it a 40. Game Rant gives it a 20. So definitely a mixed bag across the board. And this is a good example of a game that is very subjective. You know, you, you look and you're like, okay... Do I enjoy this game? Yes. Does somebody else enjoy it? Maybe not. But that doesn't negate the value of either of those opinions. You dive in and if you enjoy it, then it's all good to go. That's what really matters in the world of gaming. But I've seen a lot of people leveraging this meta score as an example of another failure for Xbox Game Pass. Another horrible title launching in a Game Pass. More shovelware. These are the comments that I'm seeing. And to that, I say absolutely not. Scorn is the perfect example of why Game Pass provides so much value. Because if I saw a meta score of 72, I would kick Scorn down the line and I'll say, okay, I'll pick that up when it's 10 bucks in a bargain bin sale next year. With Xbox Game Pass, I don't have to do that. I have the ability to check it out day and date and see if I enjoy it. And so I have not had the chance to dive in yet. This is on the roster for this week, especially leading up to Halloween and whatnot. But I can boot it up, download it, play through it, and if I enjoy it, then it's a great game I've discovered through Game Pass that I wouldn't have found otherwise 
until at least a year or two down the line. If I don't enjoy it, and the first 10 minutes totally turns me off, I turn off the game, I uninstall it, no harm, no foul, I checked it out and gave it a shot without having to pay 60 or $70. That is the beauty of Xbox Game Pass, my friends. And so it's not that every game on the service has to be a 10 out of 10 banger. We do get those. And we're getting ready to get one this week with the Plague Tale Requiem, which we'll talk about more in a moment. But Scorn is a perfect example of a game that I can check out with my subscription. Uh, so if you want to dive in, I've heard some pretty good things. <laughs> I've heard it... Uh, described as a gory squelchy the witness i think is the way that it was it was pitched via twitter uh, so if that sounds like something you're interested in a new lineup is out right now for the xbox series x s and pc and you can dive in today before we dive into our final story of the day we have a ton of big games launching on xbox this week including ghostbusters spirits unleashed launching on october the 18th alongside a plague tale requiem which is coming to game pass on day one Personally, A Plague Tale Requiem is one of my most anticipated games of the year. Totally going to be checking this one out. The Sims 4 is going free to play as well on October the 18th, which is a very big deal. And New Tales from the Borderlands lands on October the 20th, and it is going to be optimized for Xbox Series X and S. This one was announced and it just dropped. It is ready and waiting for you later on this week. Persona 5 Royal is also coming to Xbox Series X, S, and Xbox One on October the 20th with Xbox Game Pass and PC Game Pass as well. And finally, Gotham Knights is launching on October the 21st, and it is optimized for Xbox Series X and S. But as I said, looking like 30 frames per second on console. So we'll see what happens when the game officially drops later this week. All things considered, this is a great lineup of games, and there's a little something for everyone, and this is just a handful of the standouts that I picked to share with you this week. We're really hitting the stride of the fall gaming season, and it's a very exciting year at that. And while we might have a lack of huge first-party games from Team Xbox, third-party games are still definitely bringing some enjoyable experiences, and as always, it's a great time to dig into that backlog. As I mentioned, I'm playing Dishonored 2, checking that out, going back, seeing what Deathloop has to offer in the Arcane Studios world. Uh, lots of cool stuff out there, so dive in and let me know down below. What are you playing this week and what games are you looking forward to for the fall season? Finally, to wrap up today's show, following our conversation around the Logitech G Cloud gaming handheld a couple of weeks ago, Razer has announced their new Edge Android-based cloud gaming handheld. This comes in at $399 for the base Wi-Fi version, and it launches in January 2023. And unlike the G Cloud, this is more of a Switch kind of approach, where the Edge itself is actually just a tablet that then plugs into a Razer Kishi V2 Pro, which is a new controller that is launching with the Edge exclusively bundled with this device that bakes in the existing features of the Kishi V2, but it comes with haptic feedbacks as well as a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack. That's pretty much what you're going to be getting. But there is also a 5G version that's launching later in early 2023. And as far as the specs this thing is packing, we have, according to The Verge, a 6.8 inch Full HD Plus by 2400 by 1080 OLED screen that has a fast 144 hertz refresh rate. Alongside the G3X Gen 1 chipset, which Qualcomm refers to as a gaming platform, there's 8GB of LPDDR5 RAM, which should give it some speed, and 128GB of storage. It supports Bluetooth 5.2 for connecting headphones, and it also has Wi-Fi 6E connectivity, making it compatible with some of the fastest routers available, like Google's Nest Wi-Fi Pro, Eero's Pro 6, and more. The Edge has a front-facing camera, so you can stream on Twitch while you game or jump into a Zoom call. And as for battery life, Razer shared that the Edge will have a 500 milliamp hours battery, so it will likely last a while if you're just using it for cloud game streaming. With the Edge being one of many new cloud gaming handhelds out there, it's likely it'll have no issue standing out at $399, which is just $50 more than Logitech's G Cloud gaming handheld, which has lesser specs. So a couple of observations here. First and foremost, the design itself looks very good. My question is, is it good enough to warrant $399? I mean, we're talking about something that's almost an Xbox Series X or a PlayStation 5. Let's be reasonable here. How much value can this thing reasonably provide? And 
Additionally, the 144 hertz screen is really only bringing benefits if you are using Steam Link to play PC games, because if you're playing on your local network, they have confirmed that that is going to be enabled. You can play very high quality PC games via your couch or on your couch via Steam Link at a very high refresh rate. So that's great. And of course, on native apps that are installed via Android, you will have those higher refresh rates as well. So I would imagine Call of Duty Mobile, for instance, is going to be running very well on this device. But again, $399. Cloud gaming doesn't really take advantage of those 144 hertz benefits, that kind of thing. So really the benefit here is the comfort and accessibility if you are a cloud gaming player. My question is, for $399, is that gaming experience significantly better to the point that it outdoes my iPhone 13 mini with potentially an Xbox controller connected to it or even a Razer Kishi device connected to it? Uh, is that experience enough to warrant nearly half a grand for me to go in and buy one of these things? For me personally, I don't think that it is, but that's the beauty of cloud gaming and that's the beauty of what Xbox is doing. No matter how you want to experience your games, you have the opportunity to do so. For me, cloud gaming is a supplementary way I experience stuff on the go, and I can play with touch controls on the majority of my games that I want to play via my iPhone. Or, if I want to go all in, I can hook up an Xbox controller and play via my tablet. I have these devices, they're free for me to use, I'm good to go and ready to rock. But, if I wanted to go the extra mile, this Razer, uh, Razer device is out there ready and waiting for me. The Logitech G Cloud is ready and waiting for me. I can throw $300, $400 at it, and I've got that next leap towards a better gaming experience. So this is another step towards giving players choices. And if I was to buy any of them and I was a big mobile player, the 144 hertz refresh rate is certainly a game changer for me with the Edge. Uh, but... I'm not really that guy, so I'll probably stick with my iPhone, but let me know down below. Is this one that you would be interested in picking up, and do you see cloud gaming going in such a direction that it warrants these expensive devices? That wraps up this week's episode of Exhibition, an Xbox podcast. If you enjoy the show and you are new here, be sure to drop me a like down below on YouTube and hit that subscribe button on YouTube or a podcast feed of your choice to get it delivered right to you each and every Sunday at 10 a.m. Eastern Time. I think today's episode is going to be a bit late because, as I said, I did have to re-record, but hey, I bring you guys the best I can. So, until next week, you guys have a fantastic one. I'll talk to you soon, and keep on playing.